Hi everyone, um, welcome to the Sparrow Wallet workshop. I'm Craig, I'm the developer of Sparrow Wallet. Um, my goal today is not just to take you through and show you what Sparrow Wallet is, but hopefully to explain a little bit more about how Bitcoin wallets work, so that's my goal. Um, so let's get into it. The first thing um, that I kind of want to do, but I don't have time for today, is to explain the um, process of downloading any kind of Bitcoin wallet, you should always be verifying the download that you have, right? Either you compile it from source yourself or you verify the download. It's particularly important with Bitcoin wallets because we're trusting it with our funds, right? So if we have a messenger app or whatever, it's not as important. Obviously, there's a degree to which it's always important to do some verification. But with a Bitcoin wallet, it's particularly important. And that's for that, that reason. I just want to highlight, although I don't have time to actually take you through it today, the process of verifying the release, which is here on the Sparrow download page. But let's assume that we've done that and we've got Sparrow installed. How do we go about creating a wallet in Sparrow for the first time? And what I'm going to do is take you through creating a hot wallet or a soft software wallet. And we're going to do that on the testnet network. And this is a really useful feature that Bitcoin has. So most of you are familiar with working with what we call the mainnet network, which is really where all the coins have value. And the great thing about the testnet network is that the coins have no value value at all. So you can use them in whatever way you want to, and you don't have to worry about making any mistakes. So let's go ahead and do that. It's very easy in Sparrow. We just go up to the Tools menu, and we click here, Restart in Testnet, and Sparrow closes down and then reopens, right? And you'll see here at the bottom, if you are familiar, you'll see it's actually connected to a public Testnet server. And that's fine, because, of course, the coins have no value, so it's not really important that we connect to some server out there. Otherwise, you might want to connect to your own. So let's go ahead and create a new hot wallet, right? And we do that by going up to the file menu here and clicking on new wallet. And let's give it a name. I'm just going to give it the name of test. And immediately, the settings tab opens up for us. So I'm going to take you through it step by step so we understand what the wallet's actually doing. And I want to emphasize that Sparrow is just one wallet, but they're all kind of trying to do the same thing. So everything I described today is actually common to all the wallets. Some show you more information than others, but I'm going to try and take you through it. So first of all, we're going to choose the policy type. We can either choose a signal signature wallet or a multi-signal signature. Obviously, we're just going to go for a signal signature today because I just want to keep things easy, but one can choose a multi-sig at this point as well. Then you can do the script type. So what is a script type? We have different ways of being able to lock the funds to a particular address, and that really comes down to Bitcoin's script. Now, because we can create any kind of different numbers or types of scripts, um, and it could get quite confusing, and it could mean that our coins are locked up in a particular wallet, what has actually happened is we have a number of standard types, right, where we have a sort of a set script, and all wallets follow that set script. So that's what we mean when we say a script type. And if we click on the drop down here, we see a number of different script types, and these have evolved over the years. So we have names like legacy, which obviously refer to much older ones. Currently, I would recommend that you use the native SegWit type because it has the best anonymity set for all Bitcoin wallets at this time. Taproot is newer, but unless you are doing something unusual, it's probably not the type that you want to use. So we're just going to leave it on native SegWit at this point. Then we have a descriptor, but because we haven't set up this wallet yet, there's actually nothing there. So we're going to skip on past that. And now we have these three blocks below. These three blocks here describe different ways of being able to bring keys into the Sparrow wallet. And I'm just going to take you through, the, through them all. So let's say, first of all, that you have a Trezor or a Ledger, and you've been using Ledger Live, Trezor Suite. You can run Sparrow side by side with those, right? So you don't need to go ahead and just take them out and then use some, something else. The amazing thing about Bitcoin is we're all talking to the same blockchain. So if we do that, all of the information from the blockchain is pulled into every wallet, right? So if you feel that you have been using Trezor Suite, Ledger Live, and you feel scared about trying to use something with your own node, perhaps, and you kind of want to go the Sparrow route, then you can do so side by side. You don't have to ditch one immediately. You can kind of do that. And I just want to emphasize that because I think it's something not well understood. So if you, for example, had a Trezor or 
ledger you would connect it in at this point into your USB port and you would click on that button and then you would click the scan, right? And then it would pop up here. But we're not gonna do that today. Secondly, we have an air-gapped hardware wallet. So that's a different kind of wallet where you're not gonna plug it in via USB. Instead, you would use either an SD card to transfer the files or you would use a QR code, right? So many of these wallets, for example, the seed signer, which we just saw, has a QR code that you would scan, right? And that's what you would do with the AirGut wallet. So here you see the seed signer, and if you click on the details icon, it actually, Sparrow gives you a bit of information on how you would access the QR code on that device to be able to import it. But we're not gonna do that either today. We are instead gonna create a software wallet, and that means that the keys to the wallet are included within the actual file, the actual wallet file, the Sparrow wallet file, right? I'll just cover this last one briefly. This is a watch-only wallet, which means that the private keys are not included, only the public keys, and that means it's a watch-only wallet. In other words, it cannot sign a transaction. It cannot spend the funds. And that's um, a useful wallet if you just want to watch and see what's going on without having the risk of someone being able to spend those, those, those funds. But no, let's, let's go back and create a hot wallet, which is this button here. There's three different options here. They're fairly... Um, uh, simple. The first one is the BIP39 words that everyone's familiar with, the 12 or 24 words. That's the one we're going to use. I'm going to quickly go through the others. We can also import an elect Electrum wallet, a software wallet, or we can use your seed in a binary form and import that here. But we're going to go ahead and create a 24 word seed, right? So I'm just going to click on that. Now, you see those different seed words, words there. We, I don't have a seed at this point, so I'm going to ask Sparrow to create one for me. And what Sparrow will do is just come up with this really long number, and it's going to then take that number and break it up into those 12 words. So I'm going to click on the Generate New button here, and I'm going to have these different words. Now, before I can actually use this, Sparrow is going to ask to confirm that I've written these words down. And I'm going to do something here that you shouldn't do. I'm just going to quickly type them out. So I'm just gonna open up a text editor. Now normally you would never commit a digital copy of these words. You shouldn't take a photograph of them. You shouldn't write them down in any kind of notepad as I'm about to do here. You really wanna be using pen and paper at this point because any digital copy can be easily copied and that's not what you want, right? But I'm just gonna go ahead and do this because I'm gonna use them in a second just to confirm um, that I have actually written them down. So I'm gonna type them out. Okay, great. So now I'm gonna go back to Sparrow here and I'm gonna say confirm backup. It's gonna ask me if I've written the words down, which I have, I'm gonna re-enter them. So I'm just gonna paste that in. I'm gonna create, create key store. Now it's gonna talk to you about a custom derivation path. I'll get to that in a minute, but for now we're just gonna stick with the standard path that it gives, gives me. I'm gonna click import key store and you're gonna see that those four buttons that were down below have been replaced with these fields. And these fields represent that seed that I've just imported. So let's go, go through it, right? We have the different fields here. We have the software wallet, which is the kind of wallet that we have created. And if we click on the view seed button, there are those 12 words that we have just entered. We then have a label. This is just internal to the wallet. You don't really need to worry about, about this. You can make it whatever you like. But then we get down to the master fingerprint field. And what is this? This is what we get if we take the private key, which is the seed, and we then generate a public key off that. And that's really how Bitcoin works. It has this system of key pairs where you always have the private key and then a public key off it. And the master fingerprint is taking the master private key, which is represented by our seed, and then creating a master fingerprint off the public key. So what this really is, is actually just the first four bytes of that public key. Now you'll also see a little image here at the side, and that image is the, a, an algorithm that takes a graphical or visual interpretation of those four bytes. And the reason that's important, and we didn't do that today, is if you use a passphrase with your wallet, you uh, have a different image every time. So as you actually type in 
your passphrase on Sparrow, you'll see that image change. And that's quite important because human beings, we find it easier to see images, right? If I had a red image or I had a different pattern on that image, I would be able to tell that more easily and see that I'd entered the incorrect passphrase for that wallet. So that's really what that image is. Let's move on to the derivation path, which we briefly saw earlier. The derivation path is really, you can think of it as a system of folders on your computer, right? So if you have your hard drive and you have a root folder, you have a series of nested folders within that. Now, if we go through the derivation path one step at a time, this M, the small M, refers to the master key, right? So the master private key of that wallet. And then we're going to derive steps, walk down a tree, right? So the A4 refers to a standard, which is... Um, defined for the native SegWit type that we selected earlier. So all wallets that are using this native SegWit script type should be using the 84. And that's a way for wallets to be able to transfer funds between each other, right? Or be able to recreate the same wallet. The next step in this, and this is again a nested step, we have a one. Now, I have to explain that all programmers use a zero-based index. So the very first number in a zero-based index is, of course, zero. And one is therefore the second number. Why is this a one? Because we're using testnet. And if this was mainnet, which is the network that we're all familiar with, that would be a zero. So that one refers to a testnet wallet and it allows us to create a different set of keys which are separate to our mainnet set of keys even if we were reusing the same seed. The final one in this is a zero and that refers to the account. So an account is very much like you have a bank account. You can have different accounts based off the seed. And you might, for example, have a KYC account with funds that you bought from an exchange in the past, or you might have a non-KYC account. And those allow us to segregate funds in a really easy way and avoid us being able to mix those funds together. So that's our derivation path. And what we do is we apply that to the seed, and then we come up with an XPUB. In this case, because we're using testnet, it's actually called a TPUB but it's effectively the same thing. And this is really just a representation of the public key at this derivation path, right? That's all that it is. And we'll see how that's useful because all of the addresses in this wallet are going to be derived from this TPUB. And that's an important thing. It's kind of useful for us, for example, if we wanted to create a watch-only wallet. So that's basically what this is showing us. I'm going to go ahead and save this wallet. I'm going to click the apply button. I'm going to give it a simple password of test, and Sparrow is now going to save the wallet, and it's immediately going to contact the blockchain and say, are there any funds in this wallet? So let's have a look. If we go to the transactions tab, we can see that, of course, there are no transactions in this wallet. I've just generated the seed, so all of the addresses are currently empty. Let's go down and have a look at what the addresses look like in this wallet. So if I click on the addresses tab, we can see that we've got two blocks here, and we've got the receive addresses and the change ones. Why do we have these two blocks? Well, the receive addresses refer to external addresses. These are the ones that you will give out to people who want to send you funds. And then we have the change addresses. These are internal to, to, the, to the wallet. And these are ones that we would be able to, or at least the wallet would be able to use if it wanted to send funds back to itself. And we'll see why that's important in a minute when we create a transaction. But it's important that the wallet has addresses that are internal to avoid address reuse, which is really something we always want to do. So I want you just to have a quick look at this first address here, ending with EHK. If we click on the Receive tab, we'll see the same address here, EHK, right? So it's just giving us the first address in this wallet. But you'll see this derivation path a little bit below, and you'll see that the first three elements are the same as what we went through before. But then there's two extra added to the end. And those two extra are first a zero and another zero. Again, we're using a zero-based index here, so this refers to the first element in the path. And what do those mean, right? That zero refers to this first block here, the receive addresses. And if we had a one, we would be referring to the change addresses. And then finally, the last element in the path, the zero, refers to the first address in the wallet. So this derivation path is actually explains how the entire how, how the wallet creates all of these different ways and the, and all of these different 
addresses, I should say. So it's basically a key that is derived from the master seed, and then we create an address off that using the derivation path. And if we go to the addresses in the wallet and we hover over it, we can see, yes, that was 00, zero that's zero, 01, and so forth. It w works down. If we go to the change ones, we see that's 10, zero, 11, one, and so forth. And this is how all Bitcoin wallets work, or at least all standardized Bitcoin wallets work. So what I'm going to do now is basically receive some funds to this wallet. And the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to copy this address. And I'm just going to do a quick search on Bitcoin testnet faucet. And I'm going to find a testnet faucet that will send me some money, which is a great thing because, remember, these coins have no value. So I'm going to click send testnet bitcoins. And never had that before, but hopefully I can get through that. Okay, so... We're going to have now, it said it sent me a very small amount of testnet to this address. I'm going to go back to Sparrow, and hopefully we'll see those funds come in soon. We can see that we have our transactions tab. We don't have any transactions yet. So what's going on now is they're basically creating a transaction in the background, which now sends funds to this address. And what they're doing is just creating a UTXO. And what that UTXO is, while we just wait for it to arrive, is a transaction output. So all Bitcoin transactions are inputs and outputs. And we'll see that more clearly when we actually try and send it out. So here we go. It has just arrived. And they have sent me 1,000 sats, right? Very small amount of money, but it's enough for us to do what we want to do next, which is to send a transaction out from this wallet. So we're going to do that by, first of all, going down to the UTXOs tab, because I just want to explain what this is, right? What this is, is every single amount of money in Bitcoin is a UTXO. It is an unspent transaction output. As the name suggests, every transaction has outputs, and these are the ones that haven't been spent yet. So what we have here is a, an output of 1,000 sats. And if I click on that and I say send select, like, 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 selected, I can then send that amount out. Now, it's not showing that amount yet because I have to still enter an address. So I'm just actually going to click on the receive button again because I'm just going to send an amount back to myself. And that amount is, is well, that, that address is now the very first address. You'll see how this derivation path is now advanced because Sparrow doesn't want us to reuse an address. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go to the send tab, and I'm going to paste that in just to send an amount back to myself. I'm going to give it a label of test. Now, I'm going to basically reduce this to, say, 700 sats, or actually, let's just send the maximum amount. Right, so what Sparrow is now doing is it's just showing us an example of um, how the transaction is actually built up. We've got one input here, which is the 1,000 sats that we received earlier. And then we have a test output to ourselves of 890 sats. We're creating, we are spending this output, and we are creating a new output. And that's how all Bitcoin transactions work. It's actually quite a simple um, process, but it's not an account system where you kind of have a balance and you're just deducting from that balance. Everything is these inputs that get fully spent, fully destroyed in a sense, every time you create a transaction and then new outputs are created. We also have a fee, and this is shown by this second one here. Now, Sparrow is telling us in this time it's a high fee because it's actually over 10%. But that fee is the amount that the miners need to receive. Otherwise, they're not going to mine the transaction. So that's what we've, we've done here. We can, of course, change the fee if we really want to, but I'm just going to leave it at the minim minimum. We can now click Create Transaction, right? And now we see the same diagram that we had before. What we can do at this stage, if we wanted to be fancy, we could go and change a number of different uh, attributes, like we could make it non-RBF or all kinds of things. We're not going to do any of that today. We're just going to click Finalize, and then we have a number of different boxes here at the bo bottom. So if you wanted to use Seed Signer, for example, you would need to show the QR code, and you would click this Show QR Code button. And that's showing an animated QR code, which we saw with the Seed Signer workshop. And that really just contains the... Uh, the um, partially signed, or in this case, unsigned Bitcoin transaction, all the information that Seed Signer would require to be able to sign. Once Seed Signer had, has done its work, you would then click on the scan QR button, that would open up a camera, you'd hold it up, and you would get the signed transaction back into Sparrow. So that's an air gapped approach. There's another air, air gapped approach. If you were, for example, using a cold card, you would use your SD card and you would save it, this particular unsigned transaction. Trans trans transaction, which is a PSPT file, you would save it to that SD card, and 
you would ask the seed signer to sign it, and you'd load it back in. But we don't have either of those today, of course, so we're just going to sign the transaction because the key, the master key, is actually contained within this wallet. So I'm going to click on sign. It's going to ask me for the password. That's because Sparrow doesn't keep the password unencrypted in RAM. It keeps it in an encrypted state. Sorry, not the password, the, the, the master key. It keeps it in an encrypted state. So this is just a very temporary decryption sign and then throw that decrypted key away. If I type that in again, we click unlock, and you'll see that this progress bar is filled, and that's our, our key store. That's our BIP39 key store that we created earlier. It has signed this transaction. Now, if we wanted to go and, and see what the transaction actually looks like, we would click on this view transaction button. And what we're seeing down here at the bottom is effectively the binary written out in hex that actually goes into the blockchain. So this is literally the bytes that are going to be onto the blockchain forever, right? And if we really wanted to get into it, we could go and, and look at these different elements, right? But we're not going to do that today. We are just going to click on broadcast transaction. And we're going to then broadcast this transaction to the network. Now, if we go back to our wallet, we're going to see that we have a second amount here, right? And because we sent the transaction to ourselves, the only difference to the wallet balance is actually just the minor fee, right? That's all that we've actually spent. We've basically just deducted 110 sats from this wallet because we spent it to the miner. But let's go down and have a look at the UTXOs tab and see what's happened there. We now see that we have an 890 sat UTXO, and that's because we have destroyed that 1,000 sat UTXO, and I mean, I say destroyed in, in quotes because it obviously still exists on the blockchain, but it is now a spent output, and we have created a new unspent transaction output. And again, that's how Bitcoin works all the time. It's just destroy, it's uh, spending outputs and creating new ones, and that's the entire process of how a wallet works. So that's really it. That's the entire kind of process of a wallet described, and hopefully for those of you who haven't got it too much into the UTXOs before, you've got a bit better sense of how, you know, things kind of work. I've got a few minutes left, um, and I think I'm just going to quickly take you through a slightly, a few, few sort of slightly more advanced kind of ideas just to kind of pique your interest. So I'm going to open up a wallet with a few more UTXOs in it, just this one here. And I'm going to show you how you can create a transaction with a bit more privacy in it, right? So this is basically, if you wanted to create a transaction which obfuscated some of the information. Remember, if we were creating a transaction and we are sending UTXOs out, we're giving away information about ourselves, right? Even if nobody knows who owns that UTXO, if we send it to a merchant, for example, they can look at the inputs and say, well, I know that this person at least has this amount of Bitcoin, right? And what we want to kind of do is break down that so we don't necessarily have that as an obvious tell. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to create a transaction, but I'm going to change this button here at the bottom to the privacy tab. And this creates a more private transaction. So again, I'm just going to quickly send to myself. Um, I'm going to give it a label of private, for example, and I'm going to say, say 500 sats. Now, you'll see that this is a slightly different transaction construction here at the bottom. And the reason that um, it is different is because it's trying to create a transaction which looks like it is a collaborative Bitcoin transaction. And we're actually going to be talking about that in a panel in a few minutes. But, but this is basically, it's got these two different brackets here. And those are trying to indicate to us that what we are doing is creating a transaction with the potential of having more than one owner contributing inputs to this, right? So in this case, it's actually all one owner. But if you were just looking at the blockchain, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell. So we have an input here, which is spending quite a large amount. And then we have an input here, which is spending a much smaller amount. But what we have on the other side, side, side here is, is, is a bunch of different outputs. And the first one is the output that I'm sending, right? This is the address. You'll see it matches up. So that's the one that's going out. Then we have an output which is the same amount, right? And that's going back to ourselves. And then we have two change outputs. So we haven't got into the change outputs too much. But change is what is created if you don't have the exact amount that you're trying to spend. The wallet needs to send it back to itself, and it does that on a change address, which we went through earlier. But we have two change outputs here, and that's because each one of these different owners, and I say that in inverted commas because 
clearly I am the same owner here, gets their own change output. So if you were looking at the blockchain, you would say, well, here is somebody who has created an output, sent it to somebody, and is getting some, some change. But hey, there's somebody else taking part in the same trans transaction, sending the same amount back, and also getting change, right? So this, is a, this is, looks like a collaborative Bitcoin transaction. And that is bad if you're trying to analyze the chain and determine what is going, going on, because now you have a lot more doubt and you can be a lot less certain about what the actual meaning of this is. So that's basically creating a more private transaction for you using um, Sparrow. And the final thing that I'll say is you can t take this and make it into a actual collaborative transaction by clicking this button here. I won't go through it now, but what, what you can do is invite somebody to replace this output here with one of their own and actually make it a real collaborative Bitcoin transaction. So that's a really useful feature if you want to try and be a little bit more private. That's really all I have time for today, um, but hopefully it's been a little bit, hopefully it makes Bitcoin wallets a little bit clearer and explains what is actually going on on the internals when you have a wallet and when you try to um, spend with it, when you try to receive funds. Again, the important thing to remember is always try to avoid address reuse because address reuse basically two UTXOs sitting on the same address and that's not what you want. So you always want to um, have a situation where creating an address is free, doesn't cost, cost anything. Every time you receive funds, use a fresh address, don't use the same, same one. So that's it, that's all I've got time, time for, but if you have any other questions, come and find me afterwards. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.